You'd never imagine a peaceful place like the countryside could bear witness to something so shocking. But we're here to tell you, it happened, and it's been caught on tape. Farms can be seriously scary places, from basil grown inside bubbles to cows that could take your life. These are some farm experiences that will blow your mind. Join us today as we tell you the story of the American farmer who found something absolutely impossible on his property. Well, it's a discovery that could be out of this world. A farmer from Ituna says while out working in the field, he and his eldest son came across an... One, weird creature in the bushes. So this family finds this super weird little creature chilling in their yard. Like it's got a caterpillar body, but kind of looks like an alien. Naturally, they start wondering if it could be something out of a Mothman legend. But after a quick check, they figure it's not quite Mothman material, since it's got no red eyes. Thank goodness. Just plain black ones. It starts when the kid named Rowan spots it in the bushes, and he and his brother Ivan had to check it out up close. They're both a little freaked out, but totally curious. They're like, what is this thing? Should we touch it? Next thing you know, they're picking it up and brainstorming what to do with their newfound pet. After some back and forth, they decide to keep it and give it the full VIP treatment. A little habitat with a water dish, some leaves, and even cat food. You know, just in case it's a picky eater. They're not exactly sure if this thing's a carnivore, a vegetarian, or just plain weird, but they're rolling with it. In the end, they're half joking, half hoping it doesn't turn into the infamous Mothman overnight. Mothman, after all, is supposedly this half-moth, half-human with glowing red eyes. So, they're relieved this little dude seems less intense. For now, though, they're keeping an eye on this creepy tiny creature and hoping he stays as cute and caterpillar-like as he seems. But America isn't the only place where people are running into strange things in their own yards. Let's move up north to a farm in Canada and see what strange thing has seemingly dropped onto it from the heavens. Two. Strange Alien Wreckage A family of fifth-generation farmers from Ituna, Saskatchewan, is scratching their heads after stumbling upon some odd objects scattered across their land. It sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. A farmer from Ituna and his oldest son were out in the fields when they noticed a peculiar piece of debris lying around. The two aren't sure what they've found or how it ended up there. A CTV reporter met up with the father-son duo to get the scoop on this mysterious find from above. April 28th started out as a typical day on this grain farm near Ituna this year. But while working, Barry and Cody Sawchuck spotted something strange in the distance. At first, they thought it was just trash. But as they got closer, it became clear that this was no ordinary piece of litter. Barry, who farms with his three sons on their family's 10,000 acre spread in East Swin, says they've come across random debris before, but this discovery was different. Weighing in at around 100 pounds, the mysterious object was lugged back home as they began to piece together what it could be. Some clues pointed to space junk, possibly from a satellite or something that had re-entered Earth's atmosphere. Barry noted that it looked torched with scorched markings and a mix of materials, carbon fiber composite, aluminum honeycomb, and more carbon on the back. Chris Rowski, a science writer from the University of Manitoba, chimed in on the find. He said Saskatchewan has had its fair share of strange objects dropping from above. Back in 1968, a hunter near Wallen Lake stumbled upon a similar object, which was later suspected to be part of a satellite, possibly even Canada's own Alouette satellite. This isn't the first time such things have shown up unexpectedly either. In 2022, space experts in Australia examined a large piece of debris on a sheep farm, believed to be part of a SpaceX rocket. Jonathan McDowell, an astronomer from Harvard, is pretty confident the sawchucks find is another piece of SpaceX hardware. He traced a re-entry path over Saskatchewan from back in February, suggesting it could be part of a spacecraft's trunk that made its fiery return to Earth. McDowell's colleague at the University of Virginia backs him up, saying the re-entry track passed right over Saskatchewan near Ituna. But not everyone is sold on this idea. There seem to be absolutely no SpaceX satellites missing or damaged on record, and it's freaking people out. Could it be an alien detour gone wrong? or something earthly and paranormal? The Canadian Space Agency has been brought in to investigate what is going on. 
For now though, the sawchooks are back to their routine, starting seeding season and keeping one eye on the fields and the other on the sky above. Now on the subject of weird farm occurrences and what's got the farming community talking, let's delve into some seriously bizarre farms. Three, a farm submerged underwater. Just off the coast of Noli in Italy's Liguria region, divers can spot a cluster of unique underwater balloons anchored to the ocean floor, known as Nemo's Garden. This underwater greenhouse project is a pioneering initiative where researchers are cultivating more than 100 varieties of fruits, herbs, flowers, and vegetables inside futuristic underwater domes. The project began with Sergio Gambarini, president of Ocean Reef, a company specializing in diving equipment. Driven by curiosity, Gambarini wondered about the ideal growing conditions for basil and realized that the stable temperatures and ample water supply of the ocean might offer the best solution. With this vision, he and his family invested over 100,000 euros to develop air-filled underwater domes. The chosen location allows 30% of sunlight to penetrate, while the surrounding water maintains a steady temperature of about 20 degrees sags during the summer months. Within seven weeks of starting, the results were impressive, with basil growing into mature plants that, by some accounts, tasted as good as, or even better than, those grown on land. The concept behind the domes is straightforward. Each dome holds around 20,000 liters of air above a small pool of seawater. Sunlight penetrates the water and naturally warms the air and water within. Inside the domes, seawater evaporates onto the dome walls, leaving salt behind, and then condenses into freshwater droplets that fall back down to nourish the plants. This evaporation cycle, maintained by the ocean's stable temperature, keeps conditions consistent inside the domes. In the winter months, when natural light is lower, LED lights supplement the sunlight, ensuring a stable growing environment. One significant advantage of these domes is that the crops don't require any watering as they receive all their moisture from the condensation process. Additionally, there is no need for pesticides given the isolated environment. Gambarini believes this approach could prove invaluable in arid regions with limited agricultural land and resources. Imagining that within 10 to 20 years, this technology could be deployed along coastlines worldwide. He is optimistic about its potential seeing it as a viable solution for countries with abundant water access, but unsuitable farming conditions. Four, a farm in the desert. Growing veggies in the desert with seawater sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, right? But Sundrop Farms in Australia is proving it can work and even thrive. Launched in 2014, this groundbreaking facility in South Australia set out to redefine farming by cutting out traditional resources like soil, fresh water, and electricity from the grid. Instead, Sundrop Farms harnesses seawater and sunlight to produce tons of fresh tomatoes in one of the world's driest climates. So, how does it all work? Sundrop Farms massive greenhouse situated in the arid landscape near Port Augusta uses a unique approach. The plants grow not in soil, but in coconut husks, which hold moisture well and provide a stable structure. As for water, they pump in seawater directly from the Spencer Gulf, then run it through an on-site desalination system to make it safe for the crops. This desalinated water is then used to keep the plants hydrated and healthy. The energy side is equally innovative. Sundrop Farms relies primarily on a field of 23,000 mirrors, or heliostats, which focus sunlight onto a central receiver. This solar thermal plant generates enough power to desalinate the water, heat and cool the greenhouse and keep the entire facility running almost entirely off the grid. For those rare cloudy days, they have a backup system tied to the grid so the crops stay stable no matter what. To top it all off, the farm also uses sustainably sourced carbon dioxide to stimulate plant growth and carefully controlled nutrients to keep the crops thriving. The result is an impressive annual harvest of up to 18,739 tons of tomatoes grown in a desert using almost entirely renewable resources. That's insane. Sundrop Farms is pioneering a whole new way to produce food sustainably, even in some of the most challenging environments on Earth. Sundrop Farms is not the only unique prototype to come out of Australia. In another attempt to combat natural resources that are under pressure, the University of South Australia recently decided to move agriculture somewhere you could never have expected. Five 
a farm floating on the sea. Researchers from the University of South Australia have made an impressive leap forward by designing a solar-powered system that can turn seawater into fresh water, supporting crop growth without human help. This setup doesn't just power itself with solar energy, it runs entirely on it, making it a low-cost, sustainable solution that operates independently. In field trials, the research team successfully grew broccoli, lettuce, and pak choy on seawater without needing extra fresh water or ongoing maintenance. Professor Xu emphasized that their system is unique because it relies solely on solar energy to evaporate seawater and produce clean, drinkable water. He explained that, unlike other floating sea farms that use photovoltaic panels for desalination, which can be costly and energy intensive, this system is simpler and more efficient. The design cleverly uses vertical layers for the evaporator and crop growth areas, maximizing space for growing plants. Dr. Owen noted that the current model is just a starting point, and the next steps will involve scaling it up. He explained that they plan to use clusters of these small systems to produce more crops. To make the system even more affordable, the researchers are exploring using materials like rice straw fibers, which could lower the device's cost while maintaining its effectiveness. The water produced is safe for drinking, with a salt level even lower than the World Health Organization's standards for drinking water. The United Nations has projected that by 2050, around 2.4 billion people may face water scarcity, and water availability for farming could drop by about 19% due to higher demand from population growth and climate changes. Dr. Owen pointed out that while the amount of fresh water on Earth isn't decreasing, more people and climate effects are putting pressure on the limited supply we have. Since most of the world's water, 97.5%, is in the oceans, it makes sense to tap into that vast resource. The goal is to use seawater and sunlight to address the pressing issues of water shortages, food production, and the lack of farming land, making this system a promising solution for future challenges. 6. An algae farm that eats pollution. Algae are fascinating organisms with a wide range of uses, despite some of their less favorable impacts. While certain types of algae are notorious for forming algal blooms that disrupt ecosystems, others are highly valuable. They can be transformed into biofuel, nutritious food sources, or even medical products. Interestingly, some species can even impact human health by affecting the brain. These organisms, which thrive on sunlight and carbon dioxide, play a key role in oxygen production, making them a powerful tool for environmental applications. In an innovative project by Dutch and French designers from Cloud Collective, an international design group, algae farming took an unusual turn. The team set up an algae garden on a highway overpass in Switzerland as part of a garden festival in Geneva. This highway-based algae farm uses carbon dioxide from traffic emissions, along with sunlight, to produce algae in a controlled environment. The design turns an otherwise polluted area into a functional urban farming space. The setup for this urban algae garden is straightforward. Algae grow in transparent tubes, assisted by pumps, filters, and solar panels. Once the algae mature, they can be processed into a range of useful products, including biodiesel, dietary supplements, medicines, and even cosmetics. According to Cloud Collective's website, they explain that their site, a viaduct over a busy highway was far from a peaceful natural haven and instead had a particularly violent atmosphere. However, they noted that the project aimed to demonstrate how even heavily industrialized and generic spaces, like highways, could contribute to food and biomass production. The Cloud Collective team expressed hope that this creative approach would encourage other designers and architects to look at urban infrastructure differently seeing potential farming and ecological opportunities in unlikely spaces. With such an approach, even busy highways could benefit from a splash of greenery and purpose. The concept of urban algae farming opens up exciting possibilities for turning polluted, industrial areas into valuable resources for sustainable living. 7. A farm ruled by cows. Traditional dairy farms usually follow strict schedules where managers control the cows' routines, deciding when they eat, rest, and get milked. While this approach maximizes efficiency, 
Experts are concerned that it may ignore the natural behaviors of cows, which could impact their health and potentially affect milk quality. To explore a different approach, researchers at the University of Connecticut's Kellogg Dairy Center allowed a herd of 100 cows to regulate their own lives. In this experiment, the cows had the freedom to choose when to eat, rest, socialize, or even when to get milked. They would voluntarily enter an automated milking machine without any human intervention. This robotic system, designed to perform the milking process independently, identifies each cow as it enters and applies a sanitizing teat spray before attaching a teat cup with a robotic arm. In contrast to parlor milking, where cows are typically milked three times a day according to a set schedule, each robotic milking unit can serve 50 to 55 cows whenever they decide. The setup allows for a more natural flow as the cows determine their own milking schedule based on their needs. The system also gathers a wealth of data on each cow, including milk production and composition, as well as general behavior patterns. Using video cameras and internal sensors, the researchers gather insights on cow activities outside of milking, such as their grazing habits, social interactions, and overall behavior. They hope this data will reveal ways to improve cow welfare, as understanding cows' natural preferences and rhythms could lead to healthier, happier cows. The anticipated outcome is an increase in both milk quality and quantity, making it a beneficial situation for both the animals and dairy farmers. It's a win-win. 8. A snow farm. Many people are familiar with snow fences, but snow farming, especially in the skiing world, is far less known. Ski resorts typically use hours of careful planning and effort to create the perfect snowy conditions that skiers and snowboarders find each morning. The snow-covered trails are not just a product of natural snowfall, but are often enhanced by snowmaking technology, allowing resorts to open sooner in the fall by establishing a base before substantial natural snow arrives. Throughout the season, snowmaking also helps to maintain high traffic areas. However, Banff Sunshine, a ski resort located at Sunshine Village in Alberta, Canada, has taken a unique approach with snow farming. For decades, this technique has allowed the resort to capture natural snow by installing miles of fencing at its highest elevations, where windblown snow accumulates. As strong winds move across the towering Canadian Rockies, about 7,500 feet above sea level, these fences act as barriers, preventing snow from blowing away. Instead, the snow collects in large reservoirs, which staff later spread over the slopes, creating ideal skiing conditions without needing artificial snow. According to Ian Curran, the mountain operations manager at Banff Sunshine, the resort is simply capturing the natural snow that Mother Nature provides. He noted that by utilizing the existing natural resources, Banff Sunshine optimizes the conditions created by the weather. This environmentally friendly approach relies on no additional water or energy, unlike traditional snowmaking. The resort employs just four portable snowmaking machines for specific areas, such as the lower ski out and beginner slopes early in the season. But overall, their snow farming approach has proven both sustainable and effective. While the exact beginnings of snow farming at Banff Sunshine are not well documented, it is believed to have started in the mid to late 1970s gaining popularity through the 1980s. Over the years, the method has expanded, becoming a central practice at the resort. Banff Sunshine now sets up around 15 miles of snow fencing each winter, especially across its highest terrains, reaching up to 8,154 feet above sea level. This method allows the resort to open higher sections of its 3,368 acres of skyable terrain earlier in the season, providing both a sustainable and cost-effective solution. 9. Floating Farms for Cows The world's first floating dairy farm, an ambitious experimental project, seven years in the making, with a $2.9 million investment, is located in Rotterdam's bustling Merwee Haven Harbor within an industrial zone. Recently, handlers introduced 35 Meuse Rhine Issel cows, a breed indigenous to the Netherlands, onto the two-level floating platform. Concerns that the cows might suffer from seasickness or hesitate to cross the bridge onto the platform were put to rest as the animals adjusted smoothly to their novel environment, producing milk as they settled into their floating home. These cows are pioneers in the global exploration of innovative, sustainable urban agriculture, 
explained Peter van Wingerden, a Dutch engineer and the founder of Belladon, the company that brought the farm to life. Van Wingerden shared that his inspiration for the floating farm concept emerged in 2012 when he was in New York City during Hurricane Sandy. The severe flooding disrupted food distribution throughout the city, which solidified his vision to develop sustainable food production on water. Van Wingerden described floating farms as a meaningful step toward producing food close to consumers, reducing transportation costs, and enhancing food availability. While he admitted that this approach is not a complete solution, he sees it as an integral part of a hybrid model for urban agriculture and part of what he calls a circular city. The farm's design is crafted with a circular approach in mind, starting with the cow's diet. Eventually, the animals will consume local food waste, such as grain and potato peels from breweries, along with grass clippings from nearby sports fields and golf courses. This transition to a local, biologically sourced diet will be introduced gradually to help the cows adapt. The circularity of the farm extends to waste management on the platform. The cows reside on the top floor, where a robotic system collects their waste and moves it to a lower level processing area. There, a machine separates salts from the urine, and both manure and salts are utilized to fertilize a nearby grazing field on land. Approximately 90% of the urine, consisting primarily of water, is purified and either discharged into the harbor or repurposed as process water. One of the primary engineering challenges in constructing the platform was maintaining stability to support the cow's dynamic weight in a harbor where tides vary by 1.65 meters, Van Wingerden reported. So far, the innovative design has proven successful and the future looks bright. 10. Golden Dog Farm For dog lovers, Golden Dog Farm in Jeffersonville, Vermont, is truly a slice of heaven. Recently gaining viral fame, the farm offers a delightful experience called the Golden Retriever Experience, where visitors can enjoy cider and snacks while spending an hour surrounded by a cheerful group of golden retrievers, affectionately known as a happy. Operated by local couple Dana and Susan Menne of Butternut Goldens, the Happy Hour Experience allows guests to connect with at least 10 lovable golden retrievers. Although reservations fill up quickly, the farm's success wasn't always a foregone conclusion. Doug and Becca Warple, the farm's owners, were inspired to create this haven during the pandemic when Doug's job in digital advertising was disrupted. With their plans for a family cottage in Ontario thwarted by closed borders, the Warples decided to hit the road in an RV, traveling 17,000 miles and visiting 35 states with two dogs. During this journey, they conceived the idea of starting a Golden Retriever-themed business, leveraging Doug's background in social media and influencers. The couple humorously envisioned an Instagram farm full of Golden Retrievers, and soon after, fate intervened. While scouting properties, they spotted Dana Mene socializing a truckload of Golden Retrievers in town, a sign that led them to establish their farm in Vermont. Today, Golden Dog Farm isn't just about Golden Retrievers. It also features vineyards, maple syrup production, with 4,500 taps, beehives, and fruit orchards. Initially focused on setting up the farm, the Warples eventually collaborated with the Mene family, and the idea of the happy hour blossomed. Visitors now flock to the farm, eager to play, cuddle, and take photos with the charming dogs. The experience can be particularly emotional for many, offering comfort to those who have lost pets or cannot have dogs in their homes. At Golden Dog Farm, joy abounds as furry friends provide heartfelt connections and unforgettable memories for all who visit. 11. A Mystical Rare Tea Farm Nestled on the slopes of the Himalayas, the Makebari Tea Estate holds the distinction of being the oldest tea estate in Darjeeling and the world's first biodynamic tea farm. Unlike typical tea harvests that depend on the plant's growth cycles, the harvest season for a special tea at Makaibari is determined by celestial events. From March to October, tea pickers patiently await a specific night characterized by a clear sky, a full moon, and high ocean tides, all while aligning with the planetary movements. On the selected night, the atmosphere transforms into one of both spirituality and celebration. The workers engage in a unique ceremony where men beat drums and women dance, 
invoking blessings for a bountiful harvest and protection from local wildlife, such as leopards. As the moon reaches its zenith just after eight o'clock in the evening, the pickers spring into action, racing against the clock to gather the tea leaves before midnight. The belief is that harvesting under the moonlight enhances the flavor of the tea, and to maintain its exquisite taste, the leaves must be processed before dawn. While this ritual may seem unconventional, it results in the production of Silver Tips Imperial, a highly coveted tea. Its rarity and unique harvesting method have led to impressive sales figures. During a notable planetary alignment in 2014, this rare brew sold for a staggering 850 per 2.2 pounds. 12. A Deadly Cow Farm Contrary to the image of gentle dairy cows commonly found on most farms, one particular farm in Devon, England, tells a more perilous tale. Here, the cattle are not the familiar Frisian or Jersey breeds, but rather heck cattle, a breed born from an ambitious effort to resurrect the extinct Orosh, known for its fierce nature. Aurochs were characterized by their massive horns, imposing size, and aggressive temperament. Their resistance to domestication ultimately led to their extinction in the early 1600s. In the 1930s, brothers Heinz and Lutz Heck, both zoologists, took it upon themselves to bring the Auroch back from oblivion. With the backing of the Nazi party, they selectively bred domestic cattle to create Heck cattle, envisioning herds of these magnificent beasts roaming the plains of Eastern Europe in a land they believe should be free of non-Germans. While the Heck cattle indeed resemble their wild ancestors, they also share their aggressive disposition. Derek Gao, who imported 13 Heck cattle from Germany to his Devon farm with the intent of preserving the breed, quickly realized their violent tendencies. He found it necessary to cull seven of the animals due to their aggressive behavior, which posed a serious threat to anyone nearby. This sobering experience highlights the unexpected challenges that come with breeding such formidable livestock. So, which of these farm experiences shocked you the most? Which one would you like to visit most?